I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Recently, I had a mea culpa video where I talked about that you actually do, under very specific circumstances where you have an investor residency here in Nicaragua, have the legal right to take a salary and work a job as an employee, as opposed to being an investor, which you're always allowed to do even if you aren't living in the country, even if you don't have residency, you don't need any of those things to be an investor, but to be a salaried employee or to be an hourly employee where you're being paid and taking an income here in the country, you must have something that makes that possible. And I was wrong previously that uh, it was not available at all. It is actually available through the still relatively rare, but pretty broadly available investor residency. But someone asked or put forth the use case that the reason you would potentially want to work uh, or have the right to work here in Nicaragua is in case your investment failed and then you'd be able to take a job to pay for your life uh, because you weren't going to be depending on that investment. But I have some reasons why I don't think that is true, so we're going to get to that right after the bump. Before I get started, I want to have a couple like basic framework context of what we're talking about. We're talking about people coming from first world countries or countries that like to style themselves first world. It's not really a very good term as we've really determined from watching this show, I'm sure. But we're going to say, you know, North America, Europe, someplace that has a lot of jobs and pays a lot more than Nicaragua. So we're not talking about asylum seekers. We're not talking about refugees who are coming here with a long term family nest egg, sold everything that they had, moved to Nicaragua and are hoping to somehow make it based on an investment and you know that they weren't able to do in their home country. So we're not including those people and I don't think any of them are watching the show. If you are, welcome and jump in, ask questions. We'll do our best to help you, but that's not my context. So my knowledge of that is definitely lower than my knowledge of being a traditional expat where you have access to a home market. Okay, so that's the context. So there are about three major reasons why I feel this doesn't really make sense. We're going to move so you can see the dogs. <laughs> I was just talking to Jimmy from the channel last night, and he's like, you know, that the dogs in the background are so much fun. That's like a major part of the show. So I need to make more of an attempt to like get out of their way and let them be here. I'm just talking. It's the dog show, and I'm the voice in the background. So with the, uh, the, with the first thing is there are rules of investment, and there's two rules of investment. These are Scott's rules of investment, but they're very general. I've been a business person for over 25 years, so... I, maybe there's some other rules out there, but these are two that are super, super important and apply specifically when coming here to Nicaragua. These are not general rules. These are Nicaraguan investment rules for people in the context that I said. One, never invest more than you can lose. This is always true of investments, but here in Nicaragua, your chances of losing. So first of all, your chances of losing if you invest into a market that is not your home market is vastly higher than your chances of losing everything in your home market. Not because of what your home market is, but because it's your home market. You are more likely to know how to protect your assets, how to make a smart investment in your home market than in any other. That is just a general market rule, and I advise companies in Nicaragua not to invest in other countries unless they really know what they're doing for the exactly same reason. So this goes equally in all directions. Right? A, a successful, wealthy Nicaraguan group saying, wouldn't it be cool to invest in such and such a country? And unless they have a super clear reason for doing that, no, it's not cool. The idea is fun, but the financial reality is not. So I, that's a general thing. That's super hard. Then Nicaragua itself, is a very, very hard investment environment. So not only do you have don't invest money you're prepared to lose because it's a foreign market for you and you aren't as well versed in how to protect your money as regular, but Nicaragua is an extremely difficult market. So you're going to struggle more to protect your assets here, even if you have equal knowledge in both markets. So a Nicaraguan starting a business with full equal, right? You have a Nicaraguan counterpart. They have the exact same level of knowledge and business acumen and all that as you. If they start a business in Nicaragua and you start a business in the USA, Canada, England, Germany, Australia, you have an advantage. You are less likely to have things go super wrong. It's not going to be wildly different, but you do have an advantage in all those markets. There's just more resources, more money to be made. It's easier to fail softly and not lose everything than here in Nicaragua, where it's a little bit easier to fail hard. That said, the success rate in Nicaragua for Nicaraguans isn't that bad, but they don't have the ability to go high uh, in most cases, so the, the risk of failure is much more acute. 
But for you, these are two very important aspects of never invest. If you're going to invest it, you have to picture, I'm going to lose all of this. And if you don't, excellent, that's a great win. Good for you, but you have to be prepared. If you're investing in a market like this, it only makes sense if you're in a position to lose it all because you're just gambling with it, you're doing it for fun, it's a hobby, uh, you think it's going to benefit the environment, which could be people, culture, the actual you know, trees and, and nature and stuff. All those things are great reasons to potentially be an investor here, but you gotta have that risk acceptance that losing it all is absolutely a possibility because you just don't know enough about the market. And even if you did, that risk exists for investors in your home country too. The second part is never invest here with the intent of it being your income or at least your sole income. Now, it's fine to do an investment and have some hope that it will either provide an income or more likely provide an offset to your income, meaning uh, maybe you want to make $3,000 a month to be able to live on and you're really hopeful that your business here is going to supplement that or maybe your goal is to get to 3,000 and you're making enough to live on you're making 1800 in some you know other other source of income it could be pension it could be uh, a job it could be whatever and you're hoping that by investing here maybe an extra 1200 will come in if you do really well and you'll get up to a total of the 3000 that you're hoping for these are realistic numbers and could that happen it could it'd be very difficult um, but it is plausible not in the way that most people invest the average investor has no hope of that because they invest so badly so be very very cautious of that the people who are going to do those things are exactly the ones who are going to fail at it because people who are in a position to actually invest well and make money at that are less likely to invest here because they have access to other things to invest and they know they can make more money somewhere else and just spend it here and get more for their investment. So it's very rare that someone who's actually gonna successfully invest here will invest here for that reason. But if you're thinking that you're going to need the money to live on, you shouldn't be an investor. That is, those rules are rock solid. Never invest money you aren't prepared to lose all of and two, in a situation like Nicaragua, going all in on an investment, putting your entire nest egg, including any ability you have to hold down a job into your investment here and hoping that you will not only be so successful that you don't lose the business, but so wildly successful that you can pay yourself enough to live on and, and live happily uh, just from that investment is so absolutely no, you do not do that. Is it physically possible to somehow have done that, like you'd just be so lucky with an investment that eventually you're able to live on it. It's not actually impossible, but it is so unlikely and it's so important that you understand that it's not going to happen for you. And so you can't, it's like winning the lottery. Even in the United States, it is super unlikely that your investment is going to turn into your full income or your income at all. To think the same thing in Nicaragua is just, it, it's utterly ridiculous. Now. Yes, give it a try. Don't, you know, be just be super happy should you hit that lottery and actually have a significant income from here and you're happy to live on it and then you end up giving up everything. You know, I'm not going to work anywhere else. My my investment here just magically paid off and I'm that's what I'm going to do. And at some point you're able to employ yourself, you're able to work at your investment and you're kind of earning your pay not from the investment, but your investment is creating a framework for you to work there. Fine. And that mix of your investment doing well and you working there is creating your like all that's fine, do not count on it, period. Not but or if or no. Do not invest if you can't lose it. Do not invest if you're feeling you need to live off of that investment. Invest it somewhere else where you will be able to live off that investment instead of investing where it's essentially guaranteed that you won't. All right, that was my first point that establishes when you should be investing. Now let's talk about you did invest, you lost everything, do you want to take a job here in Nicaragua? So the nature of the context, remember, we said that you are from another country, you have the resources to invest, you uh, have this context of access to these other markets. That means you have the ability to work in those markets. I don't know of any exception to this. In theory, there could be an exception to this, but I don't know what it is. It is certainly not something that affects anyone I've ever met or talked to or theoretically designed, right? So if you have access to these markets, you can go work remotely in those markets and make significantly more money than you could make here by doing that. So you should have access to jobs that Nicaraguans don't have access to by the nature of you being a citizen of whatever other country it may be. 
and using that, you should be able to work online and make enough money to live on. It doesn't really matter what skill set you have, what you do. You should be employable theoretically, right? If you're employable at all, you should be employable to the point where you're able to make enough money online to live on. There may be some challenge to getting, you know, finding the right job. It may be hard. It may be, you know, whatever. It may not be at a time that you like. That's how jobs are. If jobs were just fun, they wouldn't really be jobs, right? So <clears throat> in, in, in it, I know it sounds like you're going to say, but I can't find a job. Okay. But if you can't find a job remotely where you have more right to work, more capability, more value, how do you expect to find a job here, right? So if you are unemployable in your home country, where all the countries I named, all the regions that I named, have vastly more jobs than Nicaragua does, none of them are in an employment crisis. Uh, all of them pay more, right? So if you're unemployable in larger, wealthier, employment-scarce markets, then the idea that you're going to be employable in Nicaragua, even if you're completely allowed to be, doesn't make sense. Why would someone who who has access to skilled, trained, desirable Nicaraguan resources, because there's loads of skilled, trained, desirable resources who are not getting jobs because there just aren't enough jobs. Why would they turn them down and turn down a Nicaraguan national, even if they were legally allowed to, to employ a foreigner who isn't able to be employed in their home country? What are you going to offer to the Nicaraguan uh, uh, employer to offset the risk that you're just going to up and leave, the the fact that you weren't able to be employed in your country, like it just logically doesn't make sense that in a situation where you have access to these better jobs and you can't get one, that coming to the hardest place where you know half the population, half of the existing population can't find jobs. And of those that have jobs, of course, a lot of them are like government jobs, which of course have to go to Nicaraguans. A lot of them are um, you know, farm work and things that you have to live on the farm, all kinds of things, right? So the number of potential jobs that even theoretically could be legally open to a foreigner is very small in, in the grand scheme of things. To think you're going to be able to get one of those when you couldn't get something better somewhere else. And, and then of course, there's always the ethical, like if you work remotely, you're doing better for yourself, but that's also doing better for Nicaragua. But if you take it, so you're a positive, and if you take a Nicaraguan's job, instead of a Nicaraguan doing it, it's a negative. So you really want to work remotely, even if they were equal and you had equal opportunity to do either. One is good for the country and one is not. So, But that's ignoring that obvious fact. It just doesn't make sense that you would be able to work in a place where it's much easier to get a job and you would automatically make more money than you would make here. And to think that you would turn that down and say, well, I'm not going to, I'll just do it here. Or if you're in a scenario where you're just unemployable, then you're just unemployable. And that's a universal problem. And being in Nicaragua doesn't really impact that. The one thing is that you might be in a position where, okay, if I moved back to my home country, there may be manual labor. There's more jobs because some places will only hire people that can work in person, whether it's because you're physically doing physical security and obviously you can't do that remotely or you're, you're doing manual labor and that can't be done remotely. All those things, yes, there may be a reason why you need to move back to your home country. That's extremely rare, all right? There's such a small population in Nicaragua that if you're fighting for online jobs, you're likely to find one given enough time and the cost of living here is so low that your ability to take basically any work online job and survive just fine here exists. So that tends to make it that this is the place to do those things. You generally have a better opportunity for working from Nicaragua than you have living in your home country and trying to find a job, not because there aren't more jobs available, but just that the overall scenario for you works out better. So that's fine. But the point here, the point number two, is that if you needed to find a job, you would have an option to get it in your home country, or we assume no option at all. And then point number three, assuming that you were employable in your home country and you were so desirable that you were also employable in Nicaragua, that's fantastic, good for you, but you would not want to take the job in Nicaragua because it would pay a fraction, often a quarter or less than what that job will pay in the United States or in Canada or in Western Europe or in Australia. If you took the job in Nicaragua, in most cases, and we mean most, not like ah, 51, 52%, we mean 99, 98%, the job in Nicaragua won't pay you enough for you to consider it a living wage. You will, especially as a foreigner, 
likely be paid so low unless you're employing yourself and you have a, a functional investment and that's where the money's coming from. If you are just taking a job as a laborer, as a worker here in Nicaragua, chances are your income is going to be so low that you may not consider it a living wage. And it may not be a living wage because many of the Nicaraguans who earn those wages also take benefits from the, the social welfare programs. They have familial support. They're living with family or whatever. You're not, we, we assume you don't have that. You're going to be paying rent somewhere, maybe really, really, really low rent, maybe 80 dollars a month, but you're going to be paying something and that's going to make it that you don't have the financial resources to potentially survive because the Nicaraguans who are earning the same as you have additional support networks that make that income plausible. They're still incredibly poor, but they have more support in theory than you do. So even if you were in a position where you could not take a foreign job and you had to start working locally, Chances are that means you're going to have to relocate. You're not going to be able to stay in Nicaragua. Of course, there's legal issues to these things. If you did all those things, if you don't have an active investment, but you're here under investment residency, your, your residency is going to disappear, right? That's a continuous thing. It's not a invest once and, and get to stay forever kind of thing. It does give you a certain amount of time. You don't just have an investment go badly and get kicked out of the country. It's not like that. But if you're in a position where you cannot continue to invest, you blew all of your investment vehicle, you're no longer an investor legitimately. And so now you're someone who's uh, asking the government for a job. That becomes a different scenario. And now you're be the only time you would be able to do that is if you were requesting a refugee status, seeking asylum uh, in order to survive, which is plausible. But if you're coming from one of those countries, you would have to denounce your country as like politically violent or unsafe for you to return, something of that nature, that you were being politically oppressed to the point where you had to flee the country. And, you know, we hear stories, maybe the U.S. and Canada do have a number of people who can claim asylum somewhere else, but generally we assume that you can't. Even if you are in a uh, minority group and, and, you know, going back to the U.S. doesn't actually mean a death sentence to normal people. Uh, it is relatively safe, even if you are somewhat oppressed and don't have a good voice. It's not the same thing, right? So <clears throat> you have these mechanisms that now the, the person who posted this use case wasn't saying here's something you should do. And he wasn't saying um, that this would work or whatever. He was saying, this is a use case why you may want to work if you were going to do investments. Um, but so all the things we covered up until now are why I don't think that's true. But this last piece is why legally it won't work is because if you become destitute because you lost your job, then you have two problems. One is that your local income will be essentially impossible to make high enough. No job is going to pay you so much that you qualify for any other type of residency. Now, you, in theory, could be under the tourist regime for a long time, and that may be fine, but when you're coming down from a residency, that may be a little bit more difficult. You're probably never going to be leaving the country because you have financial problems. It's going to get really complicated. Just Anytime you're earning this little money, you're going to have complications. So you're looking at falling not just a little below uh, the, the income limits expected for someone living in the country full time as a foreigner, you could be looking at earning one quarter of that, not 25% less, 75% less. So nowhere close to the qualifying numbers for other types of residency. And as a foreigner living here, you do have a certain number of expenses that will hit incomes of that little very hard. When you have normal incomes that qualify for residency, things like $10 to cross the border or having to run into Managua to get a reprint on a, uh, on a cedula for a day is, is really minor. And you don't even notice it financially. And we all talk about having to drive to Managua twice a year as being so onerous. Like that's such a ridiculous thing. That's such background noise to normal people. But if you're only bringing in $300 a month and going to Managua to have your cedula reprinted or having to do a border run could cause you to lose your job and having to spend a large, you know, the cost of hiring a driver to take you to the border to get it all done pretty quickly is like $150. Well, $150 to someone who's living here as a foreign income expat is generally trivial, or you have spare time, right? I work full time. So me paying $150 to run to the border for the day, just to make it quick and easy, not a big deal. If I was retired, for example, had much lower income, had a lot of free time, wasn't working full time, then instead I might take the, the bus down for a few dollars, just spend a lot more time. I'm going to pay 150 most days for the convenience or just drive myself. I have a car. But if you're making 
Nicaraguan wages, you likely can't do those things. So suddenly you're taking time off of work, burning all of your vacation time if you've accrued it just to deal with being a foreigner in the country. So it's very difficult financially if you fall into that situation. And of course, like I said, you're not going to qualify for any residencies. So you're going to be stuck under the tourist regime at best case scenario. The second part is you will, without that investment residency, those other residency options or the tourist regime do not allow you to work. So even if you did that and you failed and you found a job that paid enough to qualify for the other residencies, it doesn't qualify for the other residencies because you're not bringing the money in from the outside. You have to bring in enough money from the outside and work an inside job if that's what you want, inside job, an internal job here in Nicaragua for that residency to qualify. And so at that point, you're already working an outside job, work more and earn more that way. But it, that's the only way you're going to earn enough to hit that cap. But even with that cap, even if you make enough externally, you won't be allowed to work internally because you have to get back up to the investment uh, uh, residency, which is extremely hard to get. It takes a lot of time. It just it doesn't work. So the use case, I don't think realistically makes sense. Like we can contrive a bizarre scenario where it's so extreme, but no person on earth is likely to ever actually fall into that contrived scenario. So I get it. It's a theoretical use case. Yeah. In theory, you don't need to make laws for people who don't in theory exist, but that's, it, it's basically, there's no real scenario where that would actually make sense. And then the legal part is even if, even that they do provide this for the, re the investment residency, it doesn't actually play out. Once you've had that failure, your options to work are gone. It is only that you can, and there's, you could get a few months, right? You could get a year maybe, but you couldn't long-term do it. The idea of the investment uh, residency allowing you to work is that you're allowed to work as an active investor. You're allowed to move into the country and really just depend on the country for your income if you're being successful and that's really working and they deem you know the number of employees you're creating if they're like oh you're taking one job but creating 20 well i don't know why but okay right that's you're a net positive and if you have some weird way that you're able to create all those jobs while taking one because you're taking one well, great. You're, you're creating jobs. You're, you're doing good. And just no one anticipated how you were going to do it. And I can't come up with what that scenario is. So, you know, it could be out there. I certainly don't know what it is, but if that's what you're doing, then that's okay. Right. They're creating rules to give you that flexibility. And like we talked about in the mea culpa video, there's a lot of, uh, like this is, you may look like you're working in your own business. And so they want to give you the flexibility to do that. If you're create, that's where, if you're creating, you know, 20 jobs, but in order to do so, you need to work in your business to just keep the wheels turning. Fine. You're allowed to do that. Not a problem. But if that business goes away, those employees go away because you can only have employees if you're an investor, right? Then, then you don't get to keep working and the, the use case suggestion isn't actually available to you. So it's not a use case available in the real world. Thanks for joining me. Like, and subscribe questions, get down there and uh, ask away. As always, if you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. My voice is really shot today because I was out partying all night until about three o'clock in the morning. And it's always very loud. So we were shouting. It's nice to have been out though at Via Via and Geckos. We had a nice night out. I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you would be so kind, take a moment, click on one of the videos that pops up here on the screen. And of course, I'll often forget them. So scroll down and click on one of the videos that YouTube picks at random for you.